Me? A, a princess? Shut up! It's day three and I'm not gonna lie, this, this Monty shit show disease isn't a joke. And this episode got particularly nasty because Megan really brought out the big guns in this one. Megan called the engagement interview of 2017 Orchestrated reality show Says the woman who is currently starring in a reality show But it was, you know, rehearsed They both say this ridiculous thing about the engagement interview We weren't allowed to tell our story because they didn't want Until now What story? You just met! This episode also launches a direct attack on the Commonwealth. There is a long segment dedicated to the colonial history of the British Empire and how the Commonwealth is pretty much the Empire 2.0. They really pushed this racist agenda by bringing up past tragedies. And while these past tragedies are no less tragic, especially for the people who were directly or personally impacted. It's also imperative to acknowledge that the British monarchy has come a very long way. It has evolved from those times. And yet, very much in line with Meghan and Harry's way of life and way of thinking, this episode chose to only focus on the negatives. And Meghan didn't have a problem marrying into this supposedly still racist family, still very much in touch with its colonial side, despite her knowledge of their history. Because don't forget, I was a big nerd growing up. This is like an important part that people don't understand about me. My entire identity was wrapped up in being the smart one. One would think that a nerd who loved Jeopardy and big words and history and just knowledge would have been aware of this colonial past. And so why not take up the Queen's offer of marrying Harry and not being senior working royals, not being attached to this racist institution in any way whatsoever, and just go on back to Canada and continue acting? I think the answer is pretty obvious. She didn't care for the colonial history that is attached to the monarchy. They told you the thinking behind for me, including some sort of representation of all 53 of the Commonwealth countries, which yeah. was key. All she cared about was herself, elevating herself by bagging the prince, getting the title, and all the riches and the glory and the fanciness and the luxury that comes with it. But even that wasn't enough. The most despicable and dangerous thing that Meghan could have done so far, because we still have another three. God, please have mercy. Is bring in Samantha Markle's estranged adult daughter, Ashley Hale. I've referenced Ashley Hale before on the channel. I actually used photos of her and Meghan as proof that Meghan was indeed close to her family before Harry came along. In Ashley's case, we have photos of her with Meghan from as recently as 2016. It's almost like Ashley watched the Oprah interview as a guide on how to behave and how to air your dirty laundry. I was raised by my paternal grandparents, you know, and for me, they were, they were my parents. I don't know the nature of the relationship between Samantha and Ashley. I did, however, watch Samantha's rebuttal with Dan Wooten. I wanted my kids to be raised with their grandparents because I didn't trust babysitters when I was dealing with disability and having to work. So I felt like I was doing the yeah, Because you're in a wheelchair, with... Sam. Right. You always knew that your daughter was safe with her paternal grandparents. And that, and that was the priority. And Meghan and Harry and Netflix didn't give Samantha a right of response to clarify this. It's only their side of the story, their truth that they want out there. It was really sad to see Samantha's daughter recruited, essentially in this smear campaign. What was communicated to me was maybe some resentment. You know, some people you just can't reason with. Even if they have issues, which I'm sure they do. I mean, what family doesn't? Don't air it out in public. And I don't know anything about Ashley's personality, but she and Meghan seemed to be quite close before. And the thing with the Meghan Markle types is they target a certain type of person. They only go for people that they can manipulate and control. Having people on your side does not in any way mean that you are automatically in the right. 
So just because Megan is presenting, and this is the theme of this Netflix reality show, only people who are singing Megan's praises are being interviewed. You would think a documentary or a docuseries would have a more objective point of view where maybe a third party would be interviewed. Someone that doesn't work for Megan or doesn't exist to please her. That would have lent this some sense of credibility, but I mean, come on. Megan and Harry and credibility cannot coexist in the same sentence, let alone a docuseries. Now, Megan claims that the only reason that Ashley wasn't invited to the wedding was because of her mother, Samantha. How do we explain that this half-sister isn't invited to the wedding, but that the half-sister's daughter is? The guidance at the time was to not have her come to our wedding. Samantha responds to this too, by the way. I found out yeah. from a royal insider that the royals did not make that decision and that Ashley wow. was lied to. And my sister, in fact, was the one reportedly who told Ashley she couldn't go to the wedding. That is exactly the type of person Megan is. She doesn't do what people tell her to do. She didn't contact her father or go see him rather when the Queen of England and her son, Prince Charles, urged her to do so. You think she'd listen to some palace officials? telling her not to invite her favorite niece. The tragic thing is though that Ashley believed her and that put an end to the second round of an attempt to talk to her mother and form some kind of a relationship. They were estranged for a very long time and then they reconnected. But of course, Megan stepped in and ruined that relationship as well. She reminds me of cult leaders where no matter what they do, no matter how immorally they behave, they still have their followers, their loyal followers, as though they're under some kind of a trance. Christmas of 2017, which Megan was very kindly invited to by the very racist institution, despite the fact that she was not yet married and not yet a member of the royal family. Here she is contradicting herself once again. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. It's just like a big family like I always wanted. So let me get this straight. This supposedly racist family and racist institution were so lovely to you and gave you what you've always wanted, a big family. A big family, mind you, that she's always had, but has chosen to cut off slowly throughout the years. This wasn't just something she did when she met Harry because she deemed that she was too good for them now. She even had the audacity to mention Prince Philip and talked about how well they got along. If you're confused about why this is so disgusting, Meghan and Harry held the Oprah interview knowing that Prince Philip was essentially on his deathbed. Would you believe that they touched upon that humongous elephant in the room? Harry's Nazi incident. He goes on and on about how ignorant he was and he was only 20. Well, mind you, as someone who was also in the army, we have 20 year old lieutenants going to war. So if you're old enough to lead people at war, you're old enough to know that you don't dress up in a Nazi uniform, especially someone who is in the army and who was taught about World War II extensively as I have been. He, of all people, had zero excuses for ignorance. I sat down and spoke to the chief rabbi in London. I went to Berlin and spoke to a Holocaust survivor. You had to wear the Nazi uniform to understand what you did? And he goes and says, I could have just ignored it and got on and probably made the same mistakes over and over again in my life. I learned from that. What about the racist slurs you used against people in the army who are from different countries like Pakistan? If that's meant to be you not repeating your mistakes, then I shudder to think what you would have said or done if you hadn't learned. Speaking of the military, they show footage where they visited a military base in the United States. Upon their arrival, this is how they were introduced. The Duke Hi. and Duchess. Hi, how are you? And here I thought America declared its independence in 1776. What was really disheartening to watch though was the military awarding Meghan and Harry for raising awareness about mental health, which Harry was doing, by the way, way before he met Meghan with Catherine and William. Meghan was recognized for breaking barriers. Oh, yeah, I know, right? If there's one thing I love to do, it's researching for hard, cold evidence that completely contradicts all the bull that Meghan and Harry, or anyone for that matter, choose to spout in public. Most of the time that I was in the UK, I rarely wore color. 
So I wore a lot of muted tones, but it also was so I could just blend in. She has always loved muted, monochromatic looks. She's a huge fan of black, camel, beige, white. All the colors that she listed in this docuseries that she forced herself to wear just so she wouldn't stand out, says the woman who showed up at Princess Eugenie's wedding pretty much in a maternity outfit and announced her pregnancy at the reception. And for someone who was trying to just blend in, she sure did a lot of things that pretty much led to the opposite effect. Get this joke from Prince Harry. It's amazing what people would do when offered a huge amount of money. I mean, Harry would be an expert in that, wouldn't he? Harry, are you putting money before family? Are you putting money before family? Talk about hypocrisy. In the second episode, when Meghan portrayed herself as a daddy's girl when she was growing up, I think everyone knew, I mean, at least I certainly did, that that was her way of setting the stage to tug at people's heartstrings. Do you like that reference there? She was building up to the moment that she reveals her father's betrayal, how he sold her out to the media, his beloved little girl, his beloved Meg, just for a quick buck. First of all, he didn't do that, but it's ironic and funny that they're complaining about something that they are actually doing, that they actually make a living out of. Harry, are you putting money before family? Now she wants the world to believe that her dad got greedy and saw an opportunity to make money out of his daughter. Thomas Markle has given countless interviews explaining his side of the story and it also features in Tom Bauer's book Revenge. I made one dumb mistake and I'm never being forgiven for it. They talk about compassion. There's no compassion for, for me. There's no compassion for my family. Essentially, he was hounded by the media and he begged Harry and Meghan for help, for protection. And when they didn't give it to him, he felt that if he just gave them what they wanted, which are photos, then maybe they would finally leave him alone. And that's why he staged the paparazzi shots. And when you think about Thomas Markle, he's not an attention-seeking man. He was an extremely successful lighting director in Hollywood, an award-winning lighting director. And yet he chose to retire in Mexico away from the limelight and away from the commotion and the fuss. And so this picture that Megan is trying to portray of her father really doesn't add up with the reality of Thomas Markle. And Doria has some gall judging him and contributing to this smear campaign against him. I was absolutely stunned that Tom would become part of this circus. She was also stalked, she said it herself, except she was afforded protection because Doria, as a black woman, proved to be useful for Meghan Markle's image because Meghan played the race card, don't forget, as early as November, 2016. Towards the end, Harry says this ridiculous thing about Thomas Markle. She had a father before this and now she doesn't have a father. And I, sh I shouldered that. Firstly, Meghan Markle still has a father. He is alive in Mexico. I wish I could say alive and well, but he's still recovering from his stroke. And he has openly said time and time again that he is waiting for his daughter with open arms. He is willing to bury the hatchet, to put all the differences aside. She knows where I live. Harry's invited to come down anytime he wants. Megan's invited to come down anytime she wants. I would love that. He adores Megan, despite everything she has done to him, and despite his calling out her behavior, which he should, he's her father. The other thing is, what Harry said, the reality is that it's the other way around. Megan came in between his relationship with his father. This woman has victims lying in her wake like nothing else. And the tragedy is they are predominantly family members. At the conclusion of these three episodes, you're just left with this immense sense of how disconnected these people are. We have people who can't afford heating bills now in winter, people who live paycheck to paycheck, not knowing whether they can stay above water and keep their families fed. These are real issues that a lot of people are experiencing now. And here we have two 40 something year olds, I mean, Harry's almost 40, whining and complaining about how the media coverage isn't always as favorable as they want it to be, or how stressful it is to pick the right outfit so that the media doesn't comment negatively. And don't get me started on the gloating that permeated through these episodes and the indirect self praise, or even direct, conveyed to us through carefully curated 
photos and news clippings and footage, ironically, from the very media that they claim to despise. And finally, the contradictions are rife. They spent three hours complaining about racism when the only footage they could find was of UK citizens singing their praises, dancing in the streets, celebrating their union. At the end of the day, it's crystal clear that this is yet another platform for Meghan and Harry to spout their propaganda, to hit back at everything they don't like that is being said about them, most of which is true, especially since Megxit, and a platform to defiantly stick to their story, just as they did on The Oprah Show. I mean, she thought this would be like The Princess Diaries. Do you remember that old movie, Princess Diaries, with Anne Hathaway? There's no class in some person who goes sit like this, cross your legs like this, use this fork, don't do this. Now, I was a very little girl when The Princess Diaries was out. I think Megan was, what, 20 when it came out? So one would think she was old enough to understand that it was a work of fiction. But given that she's 41 years old today, sitting in front of a camera telling the world that royal life is nothing like The Princess Diaries, I mean, is someone going to tell her that life isn't one big movie and you're not starring in it? Because that's how she behaves. Like she's a movie character at all times, all the while being a terrible actress, ironically. The thing with Meghan and Harry is the press doesn't even have to make up false stories about them. Ever since they married, the press have simply been reporting on their bad behavior. And if they don't like that, well, then they know what they have to do. Just get out of the public eye. <sighs> Some reprieve until the next three disease-infested exposures. All right then, guess I'll go Google the Australian National Anthem. <laughs>